that's it. Okay. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Welcome to the afternoon session of the Documentary and the Legacies of Colonialism, Images, Institutions, and Economies. I'm Marissa Mormon from the Department of History, where I teach African history. Um, and I'm currently writing a book called Powerful Frequencies on Radio and the Con Consolidation of State Power in Angola. So I'm particularly interested in the film that we're going to see this afternoon, which is a film produced by the National Institute of Cinema in Mozambique. Uh, we have Prexy Nesbitt here with us. We'll have a Q&A after the film, um, but he'll, he's gonna say a few words before. Before I introduce Prexy, I'd like to say a few thank yous to our many sponsors. Um, those, those include, obviously, the Mellon Foundation, which has sponsored the Sawyer Seminar Series, of which this is the first conference. It also includes the Media School, the IU Cinema, the Institute for Advanced Study, the Black Film Center Archive, and the Office of the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Multicultural Affairs. Um, in particular for this film, Mueda Memoria y Masacre, Mueda Memory and Massacre, I would like to thank Uta Fendler and Nadine Siegert at the University of Bayreuth in Germany and the Eva Lewa House for making this film available to us and to the Goethe Institute in Germany for um, helping us secure the viewing rights. So let me say a few words now about our guest, Dr. Prexy Nesbitt. He, um, no single title fairly encapsulates the dynamism of this man and his work over many decades. He was born on the west side of Chicago, very early engaged in labor and anti-apartheid activism, um, <clears throat> started the anti-apartheid student movement, correct, at Antioch College in Ohio, um, and later worked in Southern Africa um, as an activist in the anti-apartheid movement and in the frontline um, states in the liberation of Mozambique and Angola. He served as a special delegate for the first president of Mozambique, Samora Michel, to the United States. He worked for the MacArthur Foundation in Chicago for many years. He taught at Francis Parker High School. Um, he's taught for many years at Columbia College. Um, and he's worked, continued to work as an activist. He's also traveled over, what, 100 times mm -hmm. to the African continent, taking educational travel groups and returned just most recently, maybe 10 days ago, from taking three different groups there this summer. So um, he will join us afterwards for Q&A, but he's first going to share some words to help us create a kind of context for the film, um, give us some uh, ideas to help us think about what was independence in Mozambique about, what was it like? Prexy Nesbitt. Thank you very much, Marissa. I, I, I'd like to just say five or six sentences now, and then maybe make a couple introductory remarks before we start dialogue afterwards. Let me say first that Moida took place uh, June 16, 1960. It was a gathering of peasants protesting various regulations of the colonial government a gathering that took place at the colonial governor's place in Cap Delgado, northern Mozambique. At some point, the governor ordered his troops to open fire on this group of peasants, largely women, and somewhere between 100 and 600 people. Some people have said it was as few as 16, I doubt that, were actually shot and killed at that event. Moeda is a special moment in Mozambican history. It is special in the same way that it was a moment in what's called Pijiguiti in Guinea-Bissau, on the docks of Guinea-Bissau. That was a, a rallying moment for the liberation struggle. In the same way that in South Africa, there have been two, and maybe even now we could speak of a third, rallying moments. In the case of South Africa, it was first Sharpeville in 1960, and secondly, 1976, also June 16th, the Soweto Massacre. These are moments when a whole people get mobilized and moved. Mueda became the base in many respects 
of the Mozambican national liberation struggle because Moida is no located in northern Mozambique in a place called Cap Delgado province. And that province became the takeoff place for the Mozambican guerrilla struggle against the Portuguese army. And it was very much a guerrilla struggle. It was never any intent or objective on the part of the leadership of Free Limo to go down into uh, Maputo and march in victoriously as happened in Havana, Cuba. Rather, they saw a long war of attrition that would wear down the Portuguese government. Uh, it did go on till 1975 when finally, as many of you probably know, the combination of the three different wars Portugal was trying to wage against anti-colonial movements in Guinea-Bissau, in Angola, and also in Mozambique, and then actually a fourth in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Portuguese-speaking East Timor, that these wore down the Portuguese government and out of the armed forces movement came a, a movement to overthrow this, the regime of Portugal, uh, the Caetano government, and that armed forces movement, after overthrowing it, opened up to negotiate with the movements. And those three movements, and later also East Timor, all then moved to uh, a process of independence. Moeda was a very important moment, though, and it will stand always in the same way that Soweto stands as a very, very important moment. I'll say some other things shortly afterwards. Let's turn to the film right now. Thank you. Claim to apoliticism of uh, the French auteurist directors, um, and which he regarded as a sort of right-wing position. Um, he later moved to Brazil and became part of the Cinema Novo movement in Brazil and has been largely associated with that movement and with those filmmakers um, and is said to be the first of that group of filmmakers to, to make a film outside of Brazil. He then returns to Mozambique at Independence in 1975 um, and is one of the founding members of the National Institute of Cinema, which is founded um, in the first act put out by the cultural ministry by the president, Samora Michelle. So it's a really important, the cinema, National Institute of Cinema is seen as a really kind of fundamental key cultural institution in Mozambique at Ind Independence. And President Michelle said um, he wanted to film the Im image of the people and return it to them. And so the Cinema Institute was really key in doing this. They filmed not only films, of which this was one, and was this film was said to be the first feature-length fiction film, which is interesting. That's something we can talk about uh, where this sits, documentary uh, feature film. But they also established um, a newsreel production unit called Kusha Kanema that filmed newsreel um, throughout the country, produced um, in 35 millimeter that showed in the remaining the cinemas that existed within the country, and then um, uh, exhibit, exhibited them also in 16 millimeter in mobile cinema uni units that had been distributed um, or offered to the Mozambican government by the Soviets um, and that were really key and important. So this film and the international, or the, sorry, the Institute, National Institute for Cinema in Mozambique were also um, sort of part of an international or transnational movement of activist filmmakers, of which Rui Guerra was one, um, which were part of a, a larger international movement of activists and political movements, of which Prexi was one in Dar es Salaam in the 1960s and 70s that supported um, Free Limo's movement and other uh, nationalist African movements, particularly those in Southern Africa um, that had a sort of delayed independence that, and that fought actually armed liberation struggles against um, colonial powers, in this case, Portugal um, and the other white settler colonial powers in Southern Africa. I just would add to that before we go to questions uh, that 
I brought a very good list of some of the other films that were done. And the other thing that I would add is that there was a very, very important movie that was done. It really follows almost right out of this film, done internationally. It was done by a man named Robert Van Lirup. And that film was called A Luta Continua, The Struggle Continues. It was formative for all of us, uh, not only in the United States, but in solidarity movements, uh, as as Melissa has pointed out, all over the world, that were rallying to support these countries that were doing the struggle against uh, colonialism and imperialism. Because the other thing that we all were very conscious of that was very important was that the struggle that the Mozambicans were up against, the struggle of the Angolans, the struggle of the people in Guinea-Bissau, was not just a struggle against the Portuguese. It was also a struggle against things like uh, the 1971 Azores package that Richard Nixon gave $436 million worth of assistance to the Portuguese. Portugal's member membership in NATO meant that it was a regular source of armaments for the Portuguese government. Um, it wasn't at all unusual for those of us doing solidarity work to go into those northern liberated areas and have people identify as um, us as Americans and, and, and young children would yell at us, American, American, inimigo, inimigo, and then people would take the time to explain to these children that no, Americans weren't the enemy. Uh, because they really identified Americans as being as much a part of the uh, forces that they were up against as they did identify uh, the Portuguese themselves. But other quick comment I want to make. Uh, some of this was just um, extraordinary. It was kind of like a drama within a drama. The, the making of the film and then the film and then the reality behind the film. And I was thinking about the comments about monkeys. Uh, and then it just I suddenly popped into my memory that I had once interviewed a group of captured Portuguese soldiers in Tanzania on behalf of the Tanzanian Home Affairs, which was taking care of these captured soldiers because Tanzania was very much the host country for the Mozambique Liberation Front. And these soldiers kept saying that they were coming to Mozambique to fight monkeys. They had literally been brainwashed to believe that they were going to fight people who had tails and that were monkeys. And they kept saying that. It would, they, they really believed it. And you remember that the Portugal was a country that was an illiterate country. I mean, the illiteracy rate in Portugal itself was about 75 or 80 percent at that time. So it was a very formative um, combat that was going on. It was a very formative and was deeply, deeply rooted in being related to the apartheid system of South Africa and colonialism in Rhodesia. The Frilimo army never just fought Portuguese soldiers. They also always fought against units of South Africans who were in Mozambique, units of, Zam of Rhodesians who were in Mozambique. Uh, it, so it, it followed naturally, actually, after Mozambique got its independence, that Mozambique then would extend at great cost, tremendous sacrifice, would extend solidarity, the same kind of solidarity to the ANC of South Africa and to the uh, ZANU of Zimbabwe that had been extended to them by the Tanzanians. It, it's also worth pointing out that Rui Guerra, um, this, this film that we just watched, um, there were apparently interventions in the film after he made it, with which he disagreed. Um, and I don't know exactly what they are, but I could guess at what they might be. But um, so that the and this also then becomes a kind of official articulation of Frilimo about you know what is the role of Mueda, what is the role of you know the guerrilla as a kind of narrator of the official 
um, narrative of, of nation and things like that. Um, but I, it's interesting also to think about, you know, this kind of, these transnational activists and filmmakers of which, you know, Rui Guerra is part, also Jean-Luc Godard is invited to start right. a tel television station um, and others get involved. Um, so that's also something that we could talk about. And some of them go and others do not. I mean, Godard is invited, but never, it doesn't sort of take off. And part of that is then the emerging conflict between the, the increasingly ossified um, authoritarian socialist position that, that the Limo comes to take on, some of which we can see sort of at the beginning of the film, right, the sort of socialist discipline, please behave <laughs> for, the, for the filmmakers, for the guys shooting the film, right, and the sort of lack of irony or lack of consciousness they don't see that, you know, Viva Free Limo sounds a whole lot like Viva Portugal, right? Which they shows up in the reenactment of the um, of the massacre. So. I think there's a certain preoccupation with uh, looking to always look at the socialist origins of these national liberation movements, and I think it's also important to point out that the other source of a lot of support for the Mozambican struggle and the Angolan struggle, especially the Mozambican struggle, were the Northern European countries, the Scandinavian countries, specifically Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and then Holland to a very large extent too. And then I think one would be remiss not to speak of the kind of solidarity that came out of the Canadians. And then lastly, at some point, Mozambique really becomes a center of a kind of international solidarity grouping, the same way that Spain and the fight in, against to defend re, Republican Spain in the 30s, Mozambique gets to be full of people from all over the world who come and identify with Mozambique's effort at socialism and with the fight against apartheid. So that I remember many... Chileans who came to work in Mozambique and who were part of that film institute and of the National Institute on Film, many Dutch people too. But it, it, there was a real, we, we had a kind of expression, you come to Mozambique and you learn about the world because you meet so many people from all over the world who were working there. I saw a hand. I can remember them doing reenactments in the camps in the late 60s. So I think that there would have been, in, in the camps, I mean, in southern Tanzania were the bases and the training camps until they had advanced enough in the liberated areas of northern Mozambique to be able to move all those trainings and stuff inside the country. But in southern Tanzania were but it was a place called Tunduru, and I can remember them doing those reenactments there. I know in 68, 69, when I was working at the Mozambique Institute in Tanzania. Danny? In 1965-66, I was a student from Antioch College in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And my tutor said to me one day at the university, come go with me down to town to the Patrice Lumumba Institute. I have a very important guest that's going to be there that I think you'd like. And I go down and I'm sitting in her classroom there and in walks Che Guevara who was there to talk with the Mozambicans. And the quick answer to what you're asking is that the Mozambicans turned down offers coming from the Cubans to be involved with the Mozambican struggle in a training capacity. And they said to them, we don't want it. We want to wage a national struggle waged by Mozambicans. And so there was never at any point, to my knowledge, except maybe a few 
small training things for maybe some kind of specialist that was arranged maybe through the Soviet Union or through East Germany. There was never any substantive engagement by the Cubans with the Mozambican struggle in the way that they were deeply involved in the Angolan struggle and the struggle in Guinea-Bissau with the PAIGC. Uh, well, later, uh, later after independence in 75, then you do find a great deal of influence of the Cubans doing education and health in Mozambique. And many Mozambicans go to work, I mean, go to study health, go to study education, and some many doctors from, Mozamb from Cuba come to work in Mozambique. But in terms of the armed struggle, there was never really any presence. Mohammed? Let me separate the two questions. In the first instance, the, I think it's too much of a shortcut to say simply that it was a result of being worn down. What happened was that Portugal, Portugal itself was really a, a fascist dictatorship inside of Portugal. And so there was movements within the armed forces movement of the Portuguese government that led to the coup that takes place in April of 1974. I think that coup was intensified by the fact that those armed forces were so stretched out by having to fight in those three different arenas, four is really, and that led to the coup taking place. Then enters in a period of negotiation of which the most difficult was the negotiations that take place in Angola, because in Angola, you have the three different uh, movements that are involved, the MPLA, the UNITA, and the FNLA. There are three different movements that have to be negotiated. Now, some people go much further than this to say UNITA and FNLA could hardly qualify at some point as being really fighting for the independence of those countries, and especially after they get more and more support from the South Africans and with the CIA support that they had. Um, I think then that out of this you emerges Free Limo in a very, very extraordinary place and greatly, greatly respected because I think of the leadership of Eduardo Monlani, the founder he unified the movements that came together to form the Mozambique Liberation Front. And I don't think it's accidental that the figure at the very end of the movie is really made to be almost just like Eduardo. He has his stature, he has his clothing, his style, that grave way, great dignity, etc. And that's not accidental. And I think that uh, in the in the, in the array of liberation movements for many years, Frilimo was, I think, one of the most respected uh, of those liberation movements. It was one of the most disciplined. Uh, it was one of the movements led by one of the most charismatic figures, Samor Machel. I have to say to you today that it's changed very considerably. And in that 40 years, we've now reached a point where Frilimo uh, has lost a lot of the standing it had. Uh, it is not too far from the kind of situation that the African National Congress has had. In the last elections, Frilimo had great trouble getting reelected. Uh, 
has lost a lot of its uh, integrity, I think, as a political force. Uh, and certainly the, the fact that the Central Committee dropped their commitment to socialism uh, is a part of that. I think it has to be analyzed further as to why they did that. I don't think it was just an internal decision, but tremendous pressures were put on them to drop being a party that was committed to any kind of revolutionary perspective. Dave, did you have a question? I think that one thing had, it did help was to create a whole series of films that are all part of that national culture of re that for a long time was a very revolutionary national culture. And it wasn't just films, it was uh, literature, it was poetry. The, the poetry that emerged out of that period is just amazing, and music. Uh, uh, I think that lots of that is gone now. It's just, it's, it's almost dead. And people um, long to have something that's more viable and vibrant like they once had. And the young people know very little about it altogether. Younger people, people in their 20s and below. But I think of things like, and people like uh, the great novelist who wrote Sleepwalking Land, what is it? Yeah, Mia Kutu. Uh, he's a good example of people who were a product of that kind of vibrant culture uh, I can remember being in Mozambique at a time when you not only had the play reenacted, uh, the massacre reenacted, but you had theater being done all over Mozambique. Uh, the way people communicated with people all the time was through some kind of cultural presentation. Lots of them, there's an incredible mural movement, and you see some of that still happening occasionally in Mozambique today. It was a revolutionary culture that produced that film, and the Institute of Cinema was very much a part of that revolutionary culture. But I think you're right in that it also became part of the apparatus that made, that you know that sort of killed it and ossified it, because it you know gets take has produces a sort of stultifying gaze, um, and this official you know officializing discourse around it with these guerrillas who become the official voice of the nation. And 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 the the povo the people who just sort of enact, right? Whereas the guerrillas speak the truth of the nation. And then, I mean, more recently, there have been sort of cinematic critiques of that particular moment, like Lucinio Dazevedo's uh, Virgin Margarita, the Virgin um, Margarita, which was a, a critique of these kind of um, clearings of prostitutes and uh, this kind of like cultural. Uh, movement or moral, it's sort of moral and cultural movements, right? Um, but uh, uh, himself, you know, Licinio de Azevedo himself, a Brazilian filmmaker who's made his career and life really in Mozambique, another one of these people who moved there at independence, put his skills um, at the service of the revolution and now has become one of, one of its greatest critics. So there's kind of a, there's been this shift over time. Yeah. But the, this, I mean, the institute itself, I think, only functioned really with any degree of um, seriousness for about 10 years. Then there was a big fire. Then in 89, the, the state sort of gives up the mantle of socialism and embraces um, capitalism, right? And it does under tremendous debt. I mean, Mozambique is the most indebted nation in the world. And there is no income anymore. I mean, literally, in the last biggest scandal that has emerged out of Mozambique recently is that the last president, Gebuza, who ironically was the political commissar in the years of the beginning of the armed struggle, basically squandered about a billion dollars of his own monies. And today the Scandinavian countries won't lend a cent to Mozambique because of the amount of corruption and squand squandering that has gone on. So very the economy is collapsing. Uh, nobody can get credit. I was just there three weeks ago, and I had friends of mine who've been in the banking industry for the last 10 years begging me to help them look for jobs outside of Mozambique. One of the, 
of the things that strikes me as interesting about this film in the context of the kinds of things that we're talking about um, and institutions and kind of continuity and ruptures is that um, the the National Institute of Cinema and the kind of his, the history around or the official story of the National Institute is that it, it marks a very clear rupture that there are no institutions, that there are no labs, that there's no, there are no film equipment, that the Portuguese up and leave, they pour cement into the water system, they rip phones out of the walls. It's a whole story about the destruction of any infrastructure that they had laid, right? Um, and that the national, that the, um, after independence, it's, it's the nationalists and, and Free Limo that builds up this whole thing from scratch, from zero. But in fact, I think that there's a different story that we could tell, and this film already starts to tell part of it for us, which is that it's actually, there's a military in infrastructure, the kinds of things that Lee was pointing to earlier, there's a, there's a military history of film that hasn't really been recounted, um, that the military used surveillance, the military used cinema, the military used sound, they dropped pan flips, they used sound technologies, um, they used cin cinema themselves. Um, and then, so it's interesting to me that we have then gorillas again in, in this film, you know, kind of presenting the story. There's a kind of continuity there that's gone largely unremarked um, and that people are only beginning, Drew Thompson is beginning to look a bit at in terms of um, photography, but I don't think people have really looked at in terms of, of cinema yet. And, uh, and I, I think though it also should be contextualized. Mozambique is under assault all this time. I mean, the South African government's forces are just constantly assaulting Mozambique. During the period of its existence, the Rhodesians are constantly assaulting Mozambique. I was in Mozambique in the war years when Renamo, the insurgent group that many people simply analyze as being a civil war situation, it was also an interventionist force that operated with methodologies that had never been seen before. I remember interviewing Renamo soldiers who specialized in torture and barbaric behaviors. And I think that the earliest appearance of child soldiers and child soldiering as a technique took place in Mozambique. It now gets more generalized and spread all over, but the pressure that Mozambique was under as a socialist country with the determination of forces in the West to, de to destroy it was, was tremendous. There were mistakes made. I'm not saying for a minute that, but I think it should be contextualized in things like, I remember the American ambassador, a man named Dennis Jett, saying that he was determined to make sure that every vestige of socialism would be wiped out of Mozambique, including getting rid of the name the People's Republic of Mozambique. He said he wanted it named the Mozam Mozambique, period. No People's Republic references. So I, I think that like with Chile, there was this assault that is part of the context that this takes place in, the mistakes that people make. Samora made huge mistakes in the way he conducted the effort to deal with trying to... to make a base for a socialist development in Mozambique. Uh, but it, it also his commitment to trying to free South Africa from apartheid led to, in my view, there's no question but who brought down that plane that killed him. There's absolutely no question. Susan. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the last part of your question. How long did the enact enactments continue? I haven't heard of them being done in the last seven or eight years, but I think they were done up until about the, I'd say until about, until 2000, I know they were done. Absolutely. And you know, 
just this year, I was there four weeks ago, and I came across something that was a, people said there's a little monument to Matola, which is a place where the South Africans raided a part of, it's a suburb of Maputo, and they killed about 12 members of the African National Congress, and they killed a whole bunch of Mozambican citizens living around this area where the ANC South Africans lived. Well, we went to see this little monument. Well, the monument turned out to be this extraordinary museum that is is, is accompanied by a live performance that's done by people from the neighborhood of the, of the event that took place at Matola. So we were just astonished to find this just incredible uh, living monument to, to this incident that took place. I would say that that kind of cultural practice is very, very common and that I think that there is, I think one of the things that was most missing is that it's so much based on women and what women do. The songs and the singing and the dance of Mozambique is all, is what women are the moving force, as was the case in the struggle. There is, at one time the word is there that we thank the sons of, uh, well it should have been sons and daughters of the Mozambican revolution because probably as much as, more probably I think than any of the other liberation struggles, women were fully integrated into uh, the, the struggle and fully integrated into the culture. And it's not accidental that you have a figure like Grasa Michelle, who is, you all know who that is, right? The former, former, is the widow of Nelson Mandela, the widow of Samora Michelle. She's a leader of the Council of Elders. Uh, she's one of the most prominent international figures anywhere today, and I think she's a product of that very wonderful viability that was there, the vibrancy in, in its peak period of the Mozambican Revolution. She was the Minister of Education when Samora was the president and when they married. And it's interesting, these kinds of reenactments actually are also done in Angola. Um, currently and have been done historically as a way of, it's a way of telling history, I mean, obviously, but it's a, it's a, it's a fairly widespread practice, and friends of mine who are filmmakers that just made a film about the history of independence in Angola, that they were constantly um, sort of treated to these performance, performances and reenactments um, when, as they were traveling throughout Angola of particular scenes, so it's still a fairly common thing, and Rui Duarte de, de Carvalho, who's a, a well-known Angolan anthropologist who since passed away was also a filmmaker. Filmed similar things right around the time of independence. Uh, similar stories of you know Portuguese massacres in Angola. So hearing that the practice is present in Mozambique and also in Angola makes me you know wonder whether it's present in other places. But more, it makes me wonder whether the reenactment practice is actually just a continuity of other reenactments of other important moments in the history of a place like Mozambique or Angola. And if it is, then I wonder, I'm just sort of thinking about the, the purpose of creating a documentary of an enactment or a reenactment that will happen anyway, repeatedly, right? So then it becomes not about telling the story to the people who do the reenactment, but the purpose becomes one of transmission. And so in deciding to do the act of creating a documentary for the purpose of transmission, I'm really interested in hearing about who you imagined the audience and purpose to be. I, I think that, I, I was thinking about this because it, it reminds me so much about the question of the kind of dramas that are being done today in South Africa. Uh, and A lot emerged out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that took place in South Africa. That whole process of trying to deal with justice in a different way. 
I think that one of the main audiences is your is the few is children is young people. It's that particularly in in situations where you can't rely on books and on schools to be able to convey that whole history and to contain the history. And much of the story of, for example, the death of Stephen Biko is being done today all over South Africa as part of the uh, telling of Biko's importance for South Africa in that period, but also it's, said, it's a way of saying to people that we have many other leaders that are there. It isn't just Nelson Mandela that has made South Africa what it is. So I think it's an important way of assuring and helping to develop a whole other generation of people to come into leadership and to come into prominence and not be scared of participation. I think it's really a participation belt in some ways. The camera is where, where one could never be. I mean, it's like that's, the, that's kind of the promise, the promise and pleasure of it in a way. And it's such an, um, it's, a, it, it, it's a highly, um, sort of looking for, um, interventionist sort of camera, right? That there's not kind of, a naturalistic camera device for, um, for, for shooting in that domain. It's inside the office when everyone else is outside. Everybody else, yeah. But the, I think the other thing it's doing is it's taking local stories. I mean, Moeda was in the north of Mozambique. Lo Mozambique is a long, thin country. And it's also making it a story, a national story. And it connects it not just to, I mean, the, 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 the political party that's named in the course of the, of the reenactment is Manu, the Mozambique African National Union. But the, the, the political party that puts its stamp on, on the official narrative is Free Limo, and that's the work that that, that guerrilla does at the end. It says, you know, the meaning of this massacre and all massacres is that everybody joined together behind Free Limo and fought for the nation. So, and that's what those reenactments do in the larger in the larger filming, and then being shown, of course, internationally, I think, as well. The other thing is, I mean, I think about these reenactments um, is they're not, they're, they're also complicated by all, all kinds of things like missionaries um, in the colonial moment and then NGOs and, and other missionaries more recently after independence because NG, NGOs use popular theater um, continuously as a form of, um, uh, as a kind of pedagogical intervention. So it's hard to know, you know, at what, what we're getting at what stage and what kind of interventions there have been in terms of producing reenactments and, and, and creating popular forms of theater. One of the latest films that's been done out of Mozambique in the absence of the National Institute on Cinema is a film about rats. And it, it's <laughs> very hard for me to watch this rat, rat film, but it's the story of the role rats are playing in demining Mozambique. It's a critical, critical role because Mozambique, Angola, or these countries, they're just full of mines, even now. And so the rats have been found to be one of the best uh, methodologies of rooting the rats out and, and rooting, rooting the landmines out because they let the rats go and the rats sniff out and then signal to their handlers where the landmines are. Now, I hate rats. I just hate them. So 
to just watch. I, I looked at part of this last night. It's online. And to just look at these little horrible little, little creatures and think that they're getting being projected as such heroes in Mozambique, I, it's, it's a bit too much for even this long time partisan in this. and come back at four o'clock for the round table. I have a, copies of this listing of films of Mozambique. If people would like them, please come and get them. <laughs>